thanks to the organizers, first of all, and the judges for giving me the chance to talk about uh, yeah, some of them of my work that I've been doing during my PhD. This is a side project, so my main uh, project when uh, so I was yeah, doing this stuff when I had some time um, and not doing making pasta. So when I was not <laughs> making pasta, I was doing this. So um, as, um, starting with this picture, which is the same picture that Randy Kamian showed uh, in his talk. And this, uh, this picture shows the, it was taken in 1970s. Uh -huh. And it's the kinetoplast DNA. So outside is uh, natural environment, which is uh, the mitochondrion of some uh, organisms of the class Kinetoplastida. And uh, what's peculiar about this structure is that it's fairly unique in nature. So these are all uh, small uh, rings that are linked together. And um, they are all packed inside this disc-like disc object, membrane, in the, in the mitochondria. And when they are taken out of from there, they look like, they look like that. So they're all linked together. So in the uh, 1990s, the group of Cozzarelli started to think about this problem from a more mathematical and topological point of view. And they, they suggested that maybe this network is made of, uh, is made of like, you can think uh, about this network as a two-dimensional layer, where you have uh, rings that are linked together in uh, this fashion. And you can check that by doing digestion experiments. So you put the uh, restriction enzymes in, in, the, in the solution. You break down the network and you see the products. And uh, you can check whether your, your, your uh, model fits the data. And um, I don't need to tell you that this structure really reminds uh, Olympic gels that were imagined by the gens. And as far as I know, no one has, has made an Olympic gel, uh, synthetic Olympic gel in, in the lab up to now. And, uh, but nature has been doing it for thousands and thousands of years. So maybe we can, we can learn from nature also in this case, try to make something smarter. So um, I started from that picture. So my work was uh, motivated by the fact that, that the kinetoplast seems to be biologically successful. No? But, um, and how can, can we understand that? I mean, can we understand something better, more of this structure? So what I know from that picture is that the, the DNA is all packed in, uh, under strong confinement in that disc-shaped object. And um, so what these people have been doing, some of them are in the audience, actually. So it was to model the, the network as a two-dimensional layers where rings were allowed to link with one another. What I did was to relax this assumption and to simply model do some Brownian dynamic simulations of, of rings that, could, that were allowed to pass through one another. And then from there, you freeze the network at some point. You compute the, the pairwise linking number. You get a network out of that. And from the network, you can compute whatever you like. So for instance, you can compute the mean balance of the network, the probability, the distribution of the linking number. And then what you can do, you can simulate. You can do the simulations of this restriction uh, digestion experiments. And uh, you can do it for different system densities. And then uh, you see that at this value of density, the products that you get, the relative abundance of the products, they match pretty well the, the data from the Cozzarelli group. So then we went back and then said, uh, well, what, what, what's, uh, what's, what's about that, that density? Well, what's special about it? And then uh, we discovered that uh, that density corresponds to this point in this graph, which shows the, uh, the size of the largest connected component in the network. So what it means is, not, is that it's surprising that it's not either down there or down or up here. It's right bang in the middle where the percolation is, is start to take place. So what we argued is that the network is near the percolation point, And then you can imagine the kinetoplast as being uh, optimizing the linkedness of the network. So it's neither. And this, this is biologically important because clearly you want to keep all the genetic material together when you divide, but then you also want to do the replication quite quickly. So you don't want to unlink, you don't want to be super linked because otherwise you'll have to do too many operations. Uh, and uh, so I don't have time to go through this part of the talk. But okay, so the, the, a very cool experiment that I, I want to just, just to mention briefly is this one. Which is, so how the replication, so even Kamin uh, was saying, how, how does the replication occur? Because if they are all linked, when they divide, <laughs> yeah, sorry.
Um, so the point is that basically the, the network seems to rotate around two fixed points, and then the mini circles get unlinked from the network and then relinked at the periphery of the network. And then you see here the tagged, uh, newly produced mini, mini circles that are introduced from the periphery and they diffuse inside the network. That was pretty cool, I thought. And we tried to come up with some simple model and we are working on it. And here I end up thanking collaborators and people I've been uh, the honor to talk to in Warwick, Gareth and Tom and Matthew, uh, in Marinduzzo in Edinburgh, in Solandini. Uh, fundings, IUP, PSSC, and this is some linked, uh, linked pasta. I want to do the whole Kineto Plus, so then uh, I got quite lazy and I stopped it too. So. <laughs> right. Okay. Time for a quick question. I've got one. The Kinetoplast network has maxi circles in it too. Did you put any of those in? No. I, they are biologically important, that is for sure. But we haven't taken them into account in the, in the model. Okay. Well, thank you. Oh, Stu. So when, when you're yes. Ah, that's a good that's a good question. We haven't checked the distribution. I haven't checked the distribution. I don't seem to have but the average valency it is three. Yes. This is a good point. Yeah, I should well, yeah, yes. I should look at it actually. Okay, let's thank our speaker again. <laughs> the next talk is by Wanda Nimskaya uh, from Warsaw talking about complex lasso topology and proteins. Okay, good morning. I feel very honored and, uh, and quite surprised to find myself on that side of the audience today. Uh, I am a mathematician who works with some theoretical stuff, uh, functional equations and so on. And uh, I was very lucky three years ago to meet Joanna Sulkowska and because of her to um, meet all of your society, work with, uh, um, with Ken, collaborate with Eric and with the others and to get, get to know a little bit of your uh, beautiful and colorful science. Um, I'm very grateful for that today. And this is my poster, which is kind of the picture of the uh, last two years of my life, uh, of my adventure of Joanna, uh, which resulted in, uh, in those free databases and uh, servers uh, on the complex topology uh, in proteins. So Joanna showed all of you uh, all of them uh, in the morning today. I will try briefly to encourage you to use them. <clears throat> so, NodeProt is the first one, uh, which collects all the information about the nodes in the proteins. So all, this, all the statistics uh, uh, from whole PDB and, and uh, detailed information about each particular structure. And what's the most important, we also have uh, server for you, where you can upload any structure. Actually, it doesn't have to be protein uh, structure, and you can um, get all the information. And in case, of, uh, in case of any questions or, or any problems with the uh, using server, please contact me. And then the second one is LassoProt. And Joanna uh, told you a little bit about Lassos. So lasso appear in the protein when we have, in, in any structure, when we have some additional bond that creates closed loop. So we have closed loop and then the tail can go through the loop. Can go, can, make, can go around or can do whatever uh, it wants. So those are the lasso types that we have found in proteins in the PDB. 
And in this case, we also have a server for you. Uh, for instance, you can upload the trajectory. Uh, you can choose some options, uh, more detailed or less detailed calculations, and, uh, and many other options, some advanced options. And uh, in the case of trajectory, you can You can get such results. So there is no time to explain you in the details, but I just want to, you to um, make me believe that from this picture, you can very, very easily uh, see that, that uh, in this case, we had some loop, and the tail went through the loop first, crossing the loop in two, in two places, and those two, um, two lines show, show us that there were two places, and then it went totally through the loop. So anyway, uh, you can really see from those uh, information the pattern of folding the protein. And you can also uh, see the detailed information about any frame, any structure. And also in any question, in the case of any questions, problems, please contact me. And then the last one, link prot, is from, uh, from this summer. It's very, very, very fresh and very tasty, hopeful. So uh, for two chains, two open chains, we close them on the, on the spur, so we obtain a few li link types for any structure with some probabilities. And what kind of links we have found in, in uh, proteins? We were looking for the uh, links between up to four chains. So with the probability uh, higher than 50%, we, we found two links uh, for two components, only for two components, Hopf and Solomon. For the probability 30%, we found Star of David as well and two links between three components. And for the probability 10%, uh, we found a couple more. That one is the most uh, complicated for two components, has 10 uh, crossings. And as I told, we checked also all the, the set of all, all uh, for um, all the sets of four com components, four chains, and those are link, link types that we found in proteins with the probability higher than 10%. And this uh, part of our project was kind of uh, exciting because uh, those structures, they aren't uh, in any tables, uh, link tables, not tables, uh, as far as I know. So uh, that was kind of exploring kind of exploring new, new things. Okay, and here we also have server for you, and in case of any questions and problems, uh, please contact me. Those uh, servers and databases are made for you, and I hope that we can together move, move on uh, with some new discoveries, with do some good things. Thank you. Okay. Quick questions. Well, I'm going to start by, I think my question's unfair. <laughs> I'm just, I want you to speculate about um, kind of looking forward about our ability to design knots, any knots with protein chains in general knowing what we do about all of the this how how, oh, so. how easy hard what what do you think the challenges might be perhaps perhaps that's un unfair so if you're really interested in my opinion uh, about that <laughs> yes i you know i'm not a specialist in the, in those in this thing what you asked about but uh, what is exciting for me with that collaboration, that they really, I, what I can see here, I really believe that uh, those things are uh, are possible, and that's what I I think uh, that, that that thing that you asked it's not easy, but I hope I will see in my lifetime. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's thank our speaker once again. Our next talk is by Antonio Suma from CISA in Trieste, Poor Translocation of Knotted Chains.
Okay. So I would like to thank the organizer for uh, choosing my poster. Uh, I'm going to talk about my work during my, during my PhD under supervision of Christian, uh, which is on Portland's location, not the chains. So uh, the motivation of our work uh, is the ongoing effort to sequence DNA. In this case, sequence single-strand DNA, making them pass through uh, nanopore. Uh, this uh, sequencing experiment are involving longer and longer chain, which have a high probability of knotting. So we ask ourselves what can be the impact uh, of the presence of some knot inside the chain when it, it starts to translocate. Uh, so our model is a really a basic flexible chain, uh, which is mapped on a single strand DNA, but uh, can be regarded as let's say, a zero model for uh, other bio biopolymers like proteins, because uh, you have uh, some charge interaction, but it's really screened. So the first work was done by our group in 2012 and uh, shows that macroscopic uh, intuition or friction is how different to uh, practical one. So I'll tell you the translocation goes as follow. Uh, so the tension from reach the pore that is located here in this case, in the green region, then the knot tightens and drags toward the pore. And here it gets stuck because we choose a pore small enough to make a single strand pass. So, uh, why our intuition fails? You can see that in the case of low forces, when they not reach the pore, uh, uh, the translocation can still continue to go on until the end. While for high forces, uh, this is not the case. As you can see, uh, it gets stuck, so we, uh, let's say, recover our intuition. So, we started from this uh, observation, let's say this phenomenology, and try to understand better uh, which is the impact of the, our different topologies, uh, most simple one, let's say, and even some uh, composite knot. Here is the, the basic phenomenology. So you have the velocity to translocate 30% of the chain for different topologies, and uh, different core represent increasing force. So in the knotted case, you have that uh, when you increase the force, the velocity is just proportional. Well, if you, uh, let's say, select here, twist knot, you have uh, what I showed before. So uh, for small forces, the translocation can go on, while for high forces, it jumps. This is the case for our twist knot. Instead, if you look at the, the torus knot, the situation is different. So yeah, the translocation can go on. Anyway, for all these cases, uh, you can see that the scale uh, of the velocity is different from the, uh, the knotted one. So in any case, you have some impact in translocation. Uh, another nice feature is that if you have composite knot and change the order in which they arrive toward the pore, you have that the velocity is different, as you can see. So uh, if you want uh, a better explanation, you can come later to my poster in the last minute. But uh, here, uh, I'll tell you briefly how we characterize uh, this phenomenology. So in particular, uh, we, we measure uh, the tractive force before and past the knot. Because you can see the knot is a dissipative machine. Uh, for which, for an applied force, you have uh, an output force which is a smaller one. We measure this output versus input force, and you can see that for the twist knot, you have the force decreased to zero, while for torus knot, uh, it continues to increase. So basically, the difference between uh, torus and twist knot is that torus knot have just uh, one single choking point, while twist knot have at least two main choking points, one at the entrance and one at the end meaning that the friction is different. Uh, this plot also uh, can let you understand why composite, composite knot uh, behave in a different way if you change the order. So you can see composite knot as the sum of sample knot, in which cases uh, you, have that, uh, you, you can, uh, let's say, compute this force as the uh, input force uh, after, uh, before the second knot using this diagram. So actually, 
uh, changing the order means that you compose these curves in different ways, meaning that, of course, you're going to have different results. And this concludes my presentation. Thank you. Okay, time for a quick question or two. Nice talk, thanks. Thank um, maybe I just missed it, but I didn't understand how you applied the force. Uh, okay, yeah, no, I didn't tell because it was too short. So the force is applied uh, just inside the pore, as done in experiment. So you just apply, let's say, an electrical field inside, and it starts to translocate. So does every bead feel a force, or just one bead, and is the force transmitted along the chain? Uh, no, no, the, okay, the force is applied just inside the pore, but of course it transmits along the chain. The, we have, we have, let's say, a lot of papers and literature on this. So we have that the force is transmitted toward the end of the chain. While you're doing it, it starts to, let's say, how do you say, uh, decide to rectify during it. Okay. Thanks. Okay, one more question. Hearing none, let's thank our speakers again. Now, on behalf of the organizers, there's some very special people we'd like to thank. One is our technician, Iqbal. So give him a hand. You know, but a very, very special thanks for our secretary, Erica Sanataro. Erica, you've done a great job. And on the behalf of the organizers, thank you for coming. This was a terrific conference and that you made it happen. So thank you.